Today is Sunday, November 20th, 2016, and this is the beginning of an interview with Richard C. Johnson. Right. At the VFW Veterans Village in Fort McCoy, Florida. Right. Richard C. Johnson, could you tell us your full name and address? I'm Richard C. Johnson. I live here at the VFW Veterans Village in Fort McCoy, Florida. My name is Justin Perkins, and I will be the inter the interviewer. Also present is Sam Kukowski, who will operate the video. Where and when? Where were you born? Valencia. V A L A T I E, New York, 1922, August 1st. How old are you today? 94. Who were your parents and what were their occupations? My mother's name was Helen Belcher. My father's name was Frank E. Johnson. My mother's was Helen Jane Johnson. I mean Belcher. Mess it all up for you. Did you have siblings? I had two girls. What were their names? The oldest girl was Helen, and the youngest was Renee. What were you doing before you entered the service? Well, I started out as a, when I was a kid working on the farm. Then when I got old enough to drive and so forth, I went in the hatchery business. I mean, I worked with someone else in the hatchery, baby chick hatchery. When did you enter the service? I was working at the hatchery and I had a classification of 2C, which means I didn't have to go to in the service because I was producing food. And and the people I worked for must have got in touch with the with the board and got me that 2C and I didn't even know it. But I had two brothers the brother that was two years younger than me, he had already gone into the Navy, and I had lots of cousins and relatives that already went to war. And uh, I knew the man that was on the board in East Long Meadow, Massachusetts, where I worked. And I one time I was down in Springfield, Massachusetts, and I decided I went to their office and told them that the next time we need somebody, um, put my name on it. And that override that 2C classification back then. And he did. It was a month or a month and a half or so, and then I got my, my um, notice. Which, and the reason, one of the reasons I wanted to go to war, but working in the hatchery, um, I had a radio that I was listening to most of the time, and uh, I knew about the war, and I kind of watched it, and I thought, we have lost an awful lot of men. If we don't do something, we're all going to be speaking Germany pretty quick. And so I said, uh, I'm going to go, and, and I did. So then, I, I guess I continue. I, when I got my, my letter, I came to, uh, I went to Fort, De Fort Devens, Massachusetts, and they brought me to Camp Landing, Florida, where I took my basic training in the summertime. From New England, where it was cool, to Florida, where you cook. 
Which branch of the service did you serve? Army. What was your rank? PFC. I was in it for the war, not for a career. Where did you serve? Went to Italy. We went to Italy on a convoy. And we spent the, the winter up north in Italy where it was cold. We slept in tents or eight men to a tent, and we had cots. And to be honest, we didn't have enough blankets. We, we scrounged papers, cardboard boxes, whatever we could do to stop that cold air from coming up through the cot. And, and in the morning when we woke up, the inside of the tent would be white from our breath going up and freezing. And there was at least a solid month that I couldn't feel my legs, but they didn't freeze. We were active. <laughs> Thank goodness. We were, they were teaching us demolition there. We had a lot of practice, but we didn't, we didn't have to go blow off something ahead of the Germans or anything. Can you describe basic training? Oh, yes I can, somewhat. Um, they assimilate everything as so though you were going in, in, into war. In other words, they, you practice, well it's, at first they show you all how to, and you try, try you practice handling the M1, which we were using back then, and everything, take it apart, put it back together, and even like if you were doing it at night, you know. And, and um, then we had the dry runs, and also there'd be a, there'd be a time when we'd be in our foxholes and then Four or five hundred feet away, it'd be a pit, and in that pit, there were GIs, which held a, a pole with a target on it. And then they would practice with live ammunition, and as, as you, they would shoot, they worked this all by whistles, and uh, then you'd hold up the flag and show them where they hit it, so they could zero in their, their rifles. In them. Did you receive any special training? No, there we we were going to be uh, infantrymen, and the last the last day of our basic training, we marched marched twenty five miles from a bivouac where we had spent a week back to the camp, 25 miles, and, and a five minute break each hour. And uh, I, I do remember and, and when we were about a mile or so from the camp, they started to play marching music. And you c couldn't believe how our columns straightened up when that marching song marching music. Yeah. What qual qualification level did you achieve? I didn't go for any special thing. I, whatever they wanted me to do, I did. And I, I drove truck in the service. I carried the radio in combat. And, um, and it's the radio is the only reason I'm still here today. Do you recall your instructors? Names? Mm -hmm. No, this is 70 some years ago. <laughs> what yeah. were they like? Oh, we had some good ones and some mean ones and so forth. Norton Emory, normally that's how they get anything done, you know. 
How did you adapt to military life? Oh, it was, what was tough for me, it, it was too hot. And I wasn't here very long in Florida before I got sunburned. And I thought I'd get court-martialed if I lost time, so I put on my clothes and worked through the sunburn healing itself. <laughs> Were you married or single? Married. What do you recall about physical regimen? Um, physical residence? Regimen. Oh. We just did it. It was no problem. If you're talking about marching, for instance, in the beginning, they tested us by... We just had brand new, sh new boots. And uh, they gave us field pack, and we hadn't, they hadn't showed us how to put it on. And we went for a march. Of course, it was hot. And uh, the further we marched, the more, the more men dropped out. After one fell off, passed out, and fell face down in the pavement, you know. And of course, we, we don't touch them. We just stepped over them, kept on going. And the medics took care of them. You know. What do you recall about the barracks? About the barracks? Um, they were nice. I forgot how many they held. But I know uh, bedtime was a certain hour. And uh, one night I was sitting on the back step. There was a street light out there. And I was trying to write my, my wife a letter. And I see this fellow walking down the street. And I hurried up and got inside and got in bed. Well, he happened to be one of the officers. And he came in and walked right straight through our, our tent or our hut, whatever you call it. And uh, he knew who, I, who it was. He saw out there that was me. <laughs> and uh, the next day I was on KP. What do you recall about the food? About what? The food. The suit? Food. Oh, the food. The food was fine. The food was fine. What do you recall about the social life? I took any weekend pass I can get. And I would go to St. Augustine 90% of the time. That was the only thing around. Some went to Stark and those places, but they were beer drinkers or whatever, you know. What was your military specialty? Oh, man, I wanted to go and everything. I figured I'd be doing the best I could, whatever, you know. Did you serve during a war? Sure did. Where did you serve? In Germany, spearheading. In fact, our outfit crossed the, the Elbe River, and the, and the Germans were—I mean, the Russians were supposed to meet us on the other side, and uh, had to turn around, come back across the river because the, the Russians were supposed to come up to that point. Were you part of specific operations? No. What are some memories of going overseas? Memories of going overseas? Mm -hmm. Took a month to get there. We went in convoy, and of course, this is in wartime, and we had destroyer escorts, and the convoy was spread out all over the ocean. They weren't together. They was here, there, so forth, and those destroyer escorts would run through all day. 
and then when we got near the, the Rock and Gibraltar, um, they wanted to be sure, I guess, that there was no subs there waiting for us. They dropped death, death charges from the boats, and uh, we went through with no trouble. Were you issued special equipment? Oh, I guess you call. Hmm. Well, some of it was special equipment, but no problem. The radio, for instance. And then when we got in Northern Italy, we were being taught how to use that explosive, which was like a plastic, you know. You could, you could mold it into a ball, you could play ball with it or anything. Just don't hit it with electric charge. How did you stay in contact with family back home? Well, mine wasn't so good. That's where my wife and I separated. But I didn't know that until I came back home. What did you do for recreation? In, while you're in the service and basic training, you, you get all the recreation you think you need. <laughs> we had calisthenics and everything, you know. And they'd be lined up maybe 100 guys or more in the field and you're all doing this different things together, you know. Did you get enough sleep? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Where were you when the war ended? When the war ended? Well, see, Roosevelt died just before we finished the war. Um, I think when they when they announced that announced it, I was in Belgium, but we were only there a short while because we had to go back in the war, fifty nine of us, and for six months of military police duty. What kind of friendships did you form while serving? I I, I formed two good buddies there. Um, one was Russell. Um, Russell Jordan and the other fellow was um, Daniel R. O'Connell. He, he, he was a tall fellow and we, 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 were, we went to Fort Devon's and not together, but we had met. And then, then when we were in Florida, we, we met some more. We were not in the same out in the same outfit. And during the war, we ended up. He was one of the. Well, he, the three of us. Ended, excuse me. Ended up in as the military police for six months. And. Uh, Daniel R. O'Connell stayed in, and he, he was he, he made a career out of it. Russell had to come home, um, some kind of injury, and uh, he died young. Um, he, he came home. He had trouble with his, his wife, and, and she died. And then he went to drinking and everything, and and he was a heavy smoker. And, uh, and got cancer in the throat. And the last time, not my, the time I saw him, he was running a men's place up in Greenfield, Massachusetts, where old men would go. You know, I guess a lot of them were 
men who had problems, no place to go, and and the and the city had a town home or something they called it, and he ran it. Did you admire the people you served with? Yeah, yeah, well, they're a nice group. Just lost too many of them. How long were you overseas? I guess a little over a year. I never figured it out. It's found my discharge anyway. How did you return home? By boat. My ship, Liberty ship. When did you return home? January. I arrived home January 30th, 1946. Were you in combat? Yes. There was nobody in front of our outfit. After we crossed the Rhine to the end of the war, there was nobody in except Germans in front of us. What action did you witness? That gets into the tough, I know. I can tell you we lost a lot of good men. Were you ever under enemy fire? Yes, yes. 288 tried to kill us and um, when the first one came through we f dove into a small dip in the f field where we were and the second one burst right close to us and that's the one that hit my radio. If I, what, that, what, if I wasn't wearing a radio I wouldn't be here today because a piece of that shell gouged the back of the radio. And my friend next to me, I, I'm sure he died shortly after I went for help. Or were you ever wounded? I was fortunate with, with that shell that um, took the radio out. Um, we were so close that if I had been looking anywhere but I, where the direction I was looking in, I would have been totally blind today because the shrapnel was so small and of course you know when it burst dirt and gravel and everything is flying and uh, it got me all on the side of the face and everything down and I had many of the, the where the stuff penetrated and uh, I had blood coming from everywhere you know. If you were, what were your duties? My duties? Yes, sir. Actually, overseas we were as a rifleman. And, and uh, even though I was carrying a radio, uh, they wanted to give me a pistol. I told them I couldn't hit nothing with a pistol. So I swapped my M1 for a carbine, which was a lighter weapon, but a good weapon. Um, the military police duties? Yes, we did that for six months in Germany. After the war. What did you do? We patrolled. And, uh, because back then the war was over now. And we had more or less policed a lot of our own soldiers who were going out with German girls and so forth and we had to get, we had a card we had to give to them that when we saw two of them walking together it would be embarrassing but we gave it to the fellow and they had to go and, and, and report someplace anyway and I mean they, it was military they had to and uh, really 
it had to do with VD and stuff like that, you know. Did you admire your commanding officer? Yes, and I, I don't even remember his name from the one I was with in combat, you know. What are your most memorable experiences? The ones I don't want to talk about. How were you received by your family? My folks, fine, but when I came home from the service, my wife had, she couldn't wait or something, and she was running around, so. How were you received by your community? Well, I left from a little village in, in the East Long Meadow, and I came back to the city of Albany, New York, and uh, I don't think anybody on the street knew who I was or where I was coming. They knew I was a soldier and probably coming home because I had a bag, you know. How did you adjust to civilian life? I had no problem adjusting. I went right back to the hatchery where I left. And they took me and I went back to work right there. What have you done since leaving the military? Well, I worked at that hatchery and they had a special truck for delivering baby chicks. And I took it into the garage. They had the brakes fixed because when the truck motor got warm, it seems like I lost my brakes. And the owner of the, the owner's brother of the hatchery saw the truck at, at the White Motors in Springfield and he took it back to the hatchery. I figured it was done, but it wasn't. And I was delivering some feed to, to one of the places where we had growers raising eggs and so forth and coming down the mountain between Holyoke, Massachusetts and East Hampton, Massachusetts and the, we lost the brakes. And the worst curve was at the bottom and I figured that, well, if anyone's coming up and at that time and I meet them at the corner, it's curtains for, for both of us. But fortunate that nobody was coming up and uh, I made it around that corner and good thing we had tires then with tubes in them because I put gravel between the tire rims and the tires on the other side of trying to stay in the road because otherwise if there was big trees there I would have would have mangled the, the truck and everything and made it. So I continued my trip the rest of the way in low gear. In order to stop the truck, you just turn off the key. In low gear, I mean, you're not going very fast. You can walk faster. Mm -hmm. And um, and that was the last day I worked at that plant. Who were you? Um, what else did you do? Um, I had a dear friend that was an inventor. And he left a message for me one day that he knew I had quit there. And he said there was an outfit in Lombard, Illinois, that was looking somebody for, looking for a person of my caliber. I should go see him. And of course, that was a thousand miles from where I lived. But I went. And I took the job. And and I, I made a year contract with him. And I was doing everything. He wanted to start a whole complete business. And in the, in the beginning, he was going to have raised all the birds he could, have them processed and put it in the freezer and open stores. And in other words, and he was going to 
eventually have his own hatchery and all that business. But after the first, when the first year was nearly all up, I had I completed my contract. I filled all those freezers and I didn't dare order any more baby chicks because where were we going to put them, you know? We could raise them, but we, the freezers were full. So I gave my notice and then there was another company in, in Illinois, Corn Belt Hatcheries Incorporated. I went there and got a job. And I worked for them about two days. And the president and, man and, and the general manager came in, said they had some problems on Hope, Arkansas. Would I go there? And I said, sure. So I went my two weeks to, to Hope, Arkansas, and helped them through their problem. Um, and the day I was supposed to fly back to Joliet, Illinois, who flies in but the president and general manager? And they said, well, let's go to Texarkana for some good southern chicken tonight. And I said, I'm supposed to fly back to Illinois. And they said, don't worry about that. We'll take care of that. So, so we're sitting in a nice restaurant in Texarkana, Texas, and eating southern fried chicken. We're all, and it was good, too. And in one of our long conversations, they uh, asked me, could I manage that hatchery they had in Hope, Arkansas? And I said, of course. That was it. So the president stayed while I came back to Illinois to get my wife and our stuff and moved to Hope, Arkansas. And I worked in that hatchery for five years. And they were raising 25000 a week when I went in. And when I left to go to Texas to start another plant, uh, I was hatching 100000 a week. So I increased the amount. And, uh, but the trouble is, I had a little girl then who was born in Hope, Arkansas. Um, she was two or three years old then. And she was allergic to the area, and we were having the dry dust storms and everything back then. And uh, the specialist said she might grow out of it, but he, he wouldn't want to. He wouldn't want to be the person raising her. So I sent my wife and my daughter, and another friend was visiting. I sent them to Greenfield, Massachusetts, from. East Texas, and, uh, and then I gave my six months notice because of my my job, and then I left. I came back to Elm, um, Massachusetts, and uh, I did a for a year. I did a little of everything, and then I bought a crane. And I went in the crane business. And so in '57, I went into the crane business, and and I I sold it in '72 and came to Florida. Who were your best friends? I had a lot of best friends through the years, and one of them just passed away. Passed away this summer. Um, I quite a few. I, it would take me a while to remember different ones. But yeah. did any siblings serve in the military? My siblings? Yes, sir. No. Oh, my brothers. I had two brothers. Yeah. What am I thinking? Yeah. Who? My brother, my who was two years younger than me. His name was was Grant Johnson. He was in the Navy, and he went in first in our our family. And he tried to talk me into it, but I went into the army. And my youngest brother went in last, and he went into a parachute. Um, No, 
or she was the t type that would, that would parachute in wherever they want them to do combat, you know. But but my youngest brother didn't uh, didn't um, actually participate with the war too late. Um, where? He told me the places where, but um, I don't remember. Has your military service impacted your feelings about the war? My number one feeling is the United States should never go to war. We can never come home when we go. The only, World War II is the only one we completed. Um, ha has it impacted your feelings about the military? No, I think all young men should spend two years at least in military. How did your wartime experiences affect your life? I guess I was just a plain hard worker. I don't know. Um, did you have post? Traumatic stress, or do you know someone who did? The only only ones I saw break down were in actual service. There was there was there was soldiers that would break down, crying for mama and so forth in the war. They had totally gone, you know. What effect did serving in the military have on your faith or spiritually, spirituality? I don't. Th I don't think it had hardly any effect. I I enjoyed going, going to church and all that. In fact, when I was in Hope, Arkansas. With the church and the people there, and I had to stay there if they didn't want me to go to Texas and start another plan, you know. Would you want your son or daughter daughter to enter the military? I would. I would, but both of my daughters are dead. Have you remained in contact with or reunited with fellow veterans? I did, but they're all dead. Who? They, they were, they, the, my, but my friends that were mil in the military, they were not in the military at the same time as me. Some of them are in the wars afterward, and I, and they some of them end up to be neighbors. Some of them end up be friends that I met here and there, and uh, some of them died from Agent Orange and other diseases, cancer mostly. I mean, you know. are you a member of any veterans organizations? Not really, but I've been supporting them for years. So. When I was working, um, you know, you get all these requests for funds and everything. Um, when I was working, I, I, did, I, did, I did a lot of that. But it seems like since I'm retired, and especially since I've run, arrived here, it seems like every week I get requests for money from some something. No.
What are some life lessons you learned in the military? Mind your own business. We got our nose in the business all over the world, and all we do is end up fighting and, and leaving men there. What lessons would, would you like to pass on to today's generation? Be honest. If you're if you're working with somebody else, do your job right. Be good to your children. Is there anything I forgot to ask you ask about your military experience? No, um, if, if I talked about those others, um, I don't think we gained a thing. It was it was not good. You know. Is there anything else you'd like to share? Well, I tell you, at my age, I forget a lot of stuff because um, often I'm telling somebody about something and it'd be just a word or two won't come to me. Might even be a city or a town or whatever. All of a sudden, it's gone. You know. So I had, to, I try to be careful because it's quite embarrassing to me too. If I get halfway through a story and all of a sudden the, the main part, it's gone. Like I wasn't talking about anything, you know. Yeah. And, uh, but I was in, I was, actually I was a te temporary scoutmaster when I was in Hope, Arkansas. And had so many boys in, in it that I had to get somebody else to help me. So we had two temporary scoutmasters and uh, took them out in, into the woods and mm -hmm. used compasses and all that stuff, you know. And then when I was younger, I was in the scouts too, enjoyed it. Overnight, cook outside where we bury your food, cook in order to cook it and everything. Um, but I sent all that stuff to, to different relatives. In fact, my granddaughter in, in uh, Long Beach, California, has a lot of that little delicate stuff, you know. And my granddaughter in Massachusetts, um, all the stuff that I had when I moved, it, she lives in a great big house, which they themselves built. Um, it's stored in her cellar. I don't know what she's going to do with it, but um, probably a couple of thousand um, the pictures that you run through a machine. Um, slides. Slides. Mm -hmm. And then albums of pictures of trips and everything. By the time she gets around to it, she won't know half of the people that's in those pictures. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. It's a real pleasure.